Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for this Crisis Coach 2018 webinar for the Association of Contingency Professionals. This is Crisis Communications, Trust and Resiliency, uh, Brand Attributes, and we are going to be following up on our conversation from last month. Uh, so this is a part of a series, uh, and we sincerely appreciate your taking the time today to join us, no matter where you are, and I hope you're warm and not snowed in uh, in the Northeast. So thanks so much for being with us today, and we would like you to connect with us. We are Firestorm Soul on Twitter, Firestorm Solutions on Facebook, Continuity, Continuity Experts on YouTube, and you can find us on LinkedIn, as always, as Firestorm Solutions. Anytime you want to engage with us in social media, just use the hashtag Crisis Coach, and we'll see your message or your communication, and we would love to connect and continue the conversation. Also, you can use the communication dashboard of GoToWebinar. It may be on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you open that little communication dashboard, you'll see there is a chat area. You can ask a question if you have a question. And if we don't get to it through this session, we certainly will follow up afterwards. And we have added a handout for you today. That handout is on today's subject, Communicating During a Crisis, and it is an infographic um, that is very large. It is not meant for printing because it's so large, um, but for viewing on a technology device. Uh, so please download that, share it with your team members, and it's a great way to start a conversation as we move forward today. As always, our attorneys would like us to tell you that this exercise or webinar is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. Any work product provided by Firestorm should be read in conjunction with all guidance given by national, regional, local authorities, as well as your organization's personal counsel. Moreover, the information given and comments made in this webinar should not be interpreted as legal advice or legal opinion. I would like to just reiterate that Firestorm has made some growth and changes since the beginning of the year. Uh, we did acquire two new companies and our parent company was listed on the NASDAQ uh, stock exchange which was very exciting. So we would like to make sure that you know that no matter what it is you need in the area of crisis and risk management, and business continuity, and come to Firestorm and we'll point you in the right direction. Whether it is crisis and risk solutions, people solutions, including recruiting business continuity professionals. And if you're looking on modifying or changing um, or exploring new careers, we have a terrific area of the website now that lists only business continuity roles. That's led by Cheyenne Marling. And uh, if anybody's going to DRJ this year, we're going to be there, so please come and talk to us. Security solutions, and that includes our National Behavioral Risk Threat Assessment Program, or BRSA. Mm -hmm. Our professional service solutions, intelligence solutions, and analytical solutions. Uh, we're going to be coming out with the first of six studies uh, very shortly. It is our annual, the seventh annual crisis event impacts study. Um, we had participants from 14 countries uh, participate over a period of a few months to gather the data. It's eye-opening. And I can give you one little piece of information. The average respondent activated plans or programs 15.2 times last year. A lot of that had to do with the hurricane. But that was an average of 15 times. Not huge crisis, but varying crisis. So, Fascinating report, and um, that will be available for purchase here in about um, two weeks. I would like to introduce you to Jay Williams. Jay Williams is the president of the Association of Contingency Professionals for the Eastern Great, Great Lakes chapter. And Jay would like to chat a little bit with you today and tell you about some things that are coming up. Jay? 
Thanks, Karen. Good morning and welcome, everyone. The Eastern Great Lakes chapter is an excellent resource for anyone charged or interested in crisis management, emergency response, risk management, and, of course, uh, technology and business uh, recovery planning. You can find information about our chapter on Facebook as well as LinkedIn. And we meet on a bi-monthly basis to talk about relevant topics and share experiences and certainly network. First-time guests are always welcome and may attend free of charge. I'm excited about our next chapter meeting, which is on March 21st. That's next week at 1 p.m. in Buffalo, New York. We have a guest speaker coming in, Cheryl Moore, from the uh, Erie County Department of Health, who's going to uh, talk about the opi opioid overdose recognition um, and the use of Narcan for reversal on that. So it's going to be a very interesting topic and, and would encourage you to um, come and understand a little bit more about, about that. The other um, thing that I'm happy to uh, re-announce, I should say, in this context is the chapter's annual conference, which is all set and booked to take place on September 11th at Batavia Downs Gaming Hotel, Casino, and Resort. And we're going to announce some early registration opportunities uh, very soon. So Keep an eye out for that. Certainly, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions regarding the chapter or the annual conference. And then lastly, I want to extend a warm welcome to Bill Baker, who's with us this morning. And he has recently accepted the responsibility of chapter president for the Atlanta ACP chapter. So welcome, Bill. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jay. And for those of you who've been on our sessions before, you know that Bill Baker is not only our moderator for these sessions, um, but is our head of operations for our Atlanta headquarter office. And Bill, I just butchered your title, and I'm sorry. Um, do you have anything you want to talk about uh, to our audience about your goals for ACP? ACP is a marvelous organization that allows good professional uh, growth in contacts, and I'm privileged to be able to work with this fine group of people. Thank you for that introduction, Jane. We're really looking forward to supporting you as you go forward, uh, Bill, and so thank you to both. Um, okay, great. I am Karen. I am uh, the Chief Intelligence Officer for Firestorm, and we're going to talk today about something that is important to all of us. And I think as continuity and uh, professionals, we know that getting folks to listen to what we're trying to say is important, and we don't always get that opportunity. I worked for an organization once that was in great turmoil and, and uh, it was a really successful company, but we had a, a period where we had high turnover in, of all things, C CEOs. And every time we wanted to plan, someone would say, we'll worry about that in six months. We'll worry about that in six months. And so everything we did was reactive. And eventually the company was sold. And I think it's because we weren't able to perform as a mature organization. Financially, we were bringing revenue in, and it was profitable, profitable, but we just couldn't get it together to be a mature organization, and that was because we were so reactive. So I really admire folks who plan, and I really enjoy these conversations. So a crisis or a disaster, as we know, it's an unexpected event. It disrupts your normal operation and can create significant financial security, safety, and reputational harm, especially today with the conduit of the speed of Internet communication, true or false, the ability to do deep harm to an organization that could be irreversible, even if it's untrue, is tremendous. And depending on the nature and severity of the crisis, the safety and well-being of your people in your building, on your property, those 
connected with your organization uh, could be presented with threats and risks. Now, the problem is, as we know, these types of events are viewed as a singularity. They are viewed as, well, it could happen to somebody else, but it's not going to happen to us. The chances of that happening to us are astronomical, but it happens to someone. When the workplace shooter returned after two years, to the canopy manufacturing plant in Florida and shot and killed three people. That was viewed as a singularity, but if we really look at it, we can see that there were many, many signs leading up to it. Workplace violence as a result of termination is not an unusual event. And the communication after the person was terminated to others in the organization was not mature. And I don't blame the victims nor uh, the, the, those in trust positions. It was a terrible situation. But we do have to learn from those events to make our own organizations better and stronger and clearer with communication. These types of events that are viewed from a singularity point of view lack communication plans. Because we say that's not going to happen, we'll deal with it in six months. We'll deal with it later. But research and analysis suggest that in reality, crises and disaster have a recognizable life cycle and have predictable stages through which the events progress. There's a terrific series on our website. It's a six-part series. And if you go to our website and search in the search area for Dr. Robert Chandler, Dr. Robert Chandler is on our expert council and is um, stages of communication expert. And he um, wrote a, a wonderful six-series uh, article for us. Um, you can also email us at webinars at firestorm.com, and I'll be happy to point you in the right direction for that series. But for your whole year, it's a great series to work with your teams on because it really covers everything in a way that's simple to understand and uh, academically sound. So we're going to start today with some just very high-level uh, concepts and hopefully get the conversation started for the rest of the year with your teams. We want to make sure that everything we do from a communication perspective highlights the sincerity of purpose that is reflected across your brand. And the way we do that is through, again, clear, clean, uh, mature communication. I worked for uh, an organization, once that same organization that was going through turmoil, and a good way to understand when it was going to, through turmoil, I, I set out on um, a goal to interview people all across the country. We had uh, about 5,000 employees, and we had uh, worldwide offices. Um, and I thought, let me just start with the United States. I'm going to contact key regional offices, and I'm going to ask them to tell me what our mission statement is. And I contacted nine people and got nine answers. Nine very different answers. So if you're starting from the point of the mission of your organization is unclear to the people in your organization, when it comes time to manage a crisis or a disaster, your communications aren't going to be as fine as they could be if that were articulated. And why do we do it? We do it for this picture. This is a picture from Virginia Tech when we were called in to help in the, at that time, one of the worst events of uh, organizational shooting. And this was what our team walked up to. And this is just a small portion of the news and media organizations that were there. This can happen outside of your organization, and you must be prepared, and you must understand what the impact of that worldwide coverage is going to be. 
So the first thing we want to do is make sure that you're setting reasonable program maturity goals. A mature program has assigned roles and responsibilities. You have home bases, core messages that you go to that come from your mission statement. They come from who you are as an organization. Those home bases then allow you to create clear message maps. And you then have a developed catalog of communication. You can get your key team to sit down every Friday, every Thursday, buy a pizza, buy a Chipotle, and sit down and say, okay, today we're going to message map for a hurricane. Next week we're going to message map in case someone in our, our organization is accused of harassment. The week after we're going to message map in case there is some ever instance of financial irregularity. And if everything works out, you'll never have to use anything at all. But wouldn't it be great if something significant organization, not that would be great, but wouldn't it be great if you and your team were able to say, here communications, we got you covered, we got we're ready with we're ready with some core messages. And once you have those created, you can then adapt them for the varying outlets that you'll be distributing to, if indeed you're even going to say anything to the public, if it's something that requires public communication. So you can modify the message for Twitter. You can use the appropriate hashtag so that people actually see your message and not the message of one of your competitors who is using a hashtag and getting their message in the stream that you're not. You can modify it for Facebook for your audience. You can modify it for LinkedIn, for your website, for media outlets, however it is that you're going to plan to communicate. So once you have those core message maps down, then you can think about those other things too. And by the end of the year, you're going to have a very comprehensive group of messages and a program to move forward with. And it's really just a step-by-step -step process. So what we're going to talk about today is where are you in that process? Some of you are going to be far down the road of doing this. Some of you are just starting out. So we're going to talk about the overall high-level goal of communicating in a disciplined fashion. and what is transparency? And that's something we're going to talk about because I think that word is thrown around in a way that confuses people. And is it a core value in your organization? So we're going to start off looking at, oops, excuse me. We're going to start off looking at this, which is proprietary to Firestorm, and it's our uh, maturity. model. And you can see down the left-hand side, we talk about decision processes, roles and responsibilities, information clarity, the speed of decision making, and your communications effectiveness. So when we look at a crisis at its highest level, well, really what Firestorm does and what I think you as continuity and contingency professionals do is we help with critical decision support, right? In a crisis, most information we know is wrong. We, we need to collect information in order to make good decisions. And if we haven't planned anything out at all, we're so busy trying to figure out who we're supposed to call first that we don't have time for some of the more mature types of decision making that have, have to be made in a crisis. Additionally, if roles and responsibilities are not clearly defined, we may try to do everything ourselves. We may reach out to the wrong person in the organization who is not able to support us in something we need done, and that causes greater confusion or delays 
in response. Information is not clear, right? And that's not, not unusual at all. If information is confusing in a crisis, we, we don't want to make decisions based upon poor information. Yesterday there was a, a report of a shooting at Northwestern University, and it turned out to be a hoax. Very quickly was uh, found to be a hoax. But again, that's a really great example of, okay, let's put our normal program into place, then let's wait for good information, and then let's help clarify and lead people to good decisions based upon good information as we learn it. But they had good they had good processes in place. They communicated well on their website. They communicated well via social media. They worked well with the local authorities. And very quickly, within about 22 minutes, were able to uh, communicate out that it was a hoax which is, goes to speed of decision making, right? You want to be able to help people survive, stay alive. You want to save your property, um, people on your property, visitors, guests, vendors, employees. And so you need to make quick, good decisions, not quick, poor decisions. And sometimes your decision making is between something bad and something bad. Just because you're making a decision doesn't mean one is better than the other. Sometimes you just have to make a decision. So we try to give as much information as possible to make good decisions. And the way we do that is by having all these pieces and parts set up ahead of time so that we have good communication processes within the organization. And that leads to our communication effectiveness. So let's look at each stage. And I want you to think about where you are. And I apologize, I hit the wrong button. So let's talk about stage one. If you're new in your role, new in your organization, or those who you're working with are new in their role. Because it's our job as professionals in this area to be mentors and educators and leaders. So in the most immature stage, people are working from everything being a surprise. They're walking down the hall saying, whoa, I never saw that coming. And if you never saw that coming, that's a problem. We, we cannot, we can't foretell every single thing that's going to happen and the way it's going to unfold. But at a high level, we can certainly plan for some things. I consulted with an organization in Florida, the year that Florida had, I don't know, they had four major storms. Um, I think this was would have been back maybe 2006. Like I can't remember exactly. I think it was 2006, um, maybe 2005. And they were in Maitland, Florida. And that was where the backup servers for the organization were, which I, I don't know. I would put my servers like, I don't know <laughs> if I would put them there. Um, and um, so they thought they had planned for almost every contingency. What they hadn't planned for was for the water to collect on the ceiling of the building and collapse the ceiling into the server room. And they um, had a real challenge uh, losing all of these servers. And somebody said, well, you know, we knew that there could be problems with flooding, but we never thought about the water coming in from above. Well, now we know. So when you're, when you're looking at things that could happen, we need to understand, instead of planning for a flood, let's plan for complete loss of a key component of our organization. Doesn't matter how it happens at the highest level, right? Just matters that we've thought about it happening. And then we can drill down. So in a, a, an immature stage, when it comes to your decision processes, are you working with an organization or with people, or do you yourself need to work out from this position of everything being a surprise? That's where processes are developed in a completely reactive state. And there's a lot of debate on it. 
So instead of solving the issue, everybody's sitting around talking about how to solve the issue or how the issue occurred in the first place, which doesn't matter. And experts are called in far too late. Everyone who is a member of the ACP has a gift because the ACP is a longtime friend of Firestorms. We call it Crisis Stop. At any time, any of you on this call today can call Bill Baker. When you call our 1-800 number during business hours, you'll probably talk to Bill. If not, you'll talk to our uh, Crisis Stop response team. And you can say, I need to activate a crisis stop. And you can talk to any of our senior principals for up to an hour, and we'll help you determine next steps in a crisis. And it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous thing. So that's what we want you to do. Call the expert first. And we're making it incredibly easy for you to do that. The next thing is under roles and responsibilities, because we're up here, everybody arguing, trying to debate on what next steps are, we also don't know who's in charge of any next step. There are high levels of confusion. Assignments are changing. There's no clear decision-making process or methodology. And so what happens? We miss some things. There are aspects or areas that are overlooked. And that can cost people their lives. Because of that, it is almost impossible to get good data because we don't even know who to get the good data from. People think data, they think, oh, let's go to IT. Well, IT doesn't pull the data and analyze it and look at trends. And you know, that, that has to happen far ahead of time. Additionally, what about when the crisis is ongoing? What's our communication strategy, especially if you have a big property? How are we communicating on the property? What happens if we lose communications on the property? What happens if we need to communicate with different divisions around the world? And we don't have communications ability. What's our backup plan? How are we going to get data? How are we going to know what's going on? And so what happens is the response from the organization is completely slowed. You're really walking in molasses when you don't have information on which to base your decision. So decision making is completely slowed. The events that are go going on suddenly outpace the leadership. In between trying to manage the crisis, you have media showing up, people's offices, at their homes, their families. You know, when uh, there was the uh, chemical contamination of an entire water source for a town in West Virginia a couple of years ago, the spouse of the new president wrote a long essay-ish Facebook post where she said, I really don't understand what the fuss is. And this fuss was after hospitals had to close because they had contaminated water, manufacturing operations had to close because they couldn't use the water, restaurants and schools had to close because there was contaminated water. This is, nobody had water for their newborn children, for their babies. And she said, I don't understand what all the fuss is. Our help drank the water, and they seemed fine. So <laughs> there's no way you can deal with that situation if you've lost complete control of other situations. So we are, we're also training our key leadership and those around them. How about the time when uh, Michael Dell was paying, of Dell, was paying $2.5 million on personal security for his family, and they hadn't checked one of his daughter's Instagram accounts where she was really telling the world every move they made. 
every place they were, what restaurants they were at. So we have to think much larger and much broader, but we can't if we haven't thought through these basics. Because at the end of the day, what we want is highly effective communication. And at this stage of the maturity, the messages are very confused. They're very reactive. We're going to miss key channels where we need to distribute our message. And we're going to be behind messaging from other people and organizations. We may put out information that people are going to say, wow, that is so 48 hours ago. So let's talk about this next stage. A little bit better than the completely immature stage. It's the reactive stage. In this area, we've at least given some thought to some things. And the decision process is somewhat generic. Somebody found a model on the web and said, OK, let's make this our decision process. Here's our grid. And the, the rights to who makes what decisions and how aren't completely clear. And there's some degree of confusion, but at least we have a model that we can work from. Roles and re responsibilities are starting to be clearer, but they're not really defined as needed. So somebody says, Joe, you're in charge of communications. But we haven't really sat down and said, what does that mean? What does being in charge of communications mean in a crisis? Does that mean you go and work with marketing and communications? Are there marketing and communications people in your organization? Does it mean you work with human resources? What does it mean? So we need clarity on that, right? So we know who the key constituents in the organization are, who has the ability to reach who we need to reach. Do we have the resources? in order to make the things happen that we need? And how are we going to get all of the issues that are occurring covered and on a smooth flow? We also then need to understand where's the data going to come from to help us understand what we're communicating or making decisions about. Um, where's the data coming from? And, and is it delayed? And, and we would expect it to be in this phase if it's not clearly defined. We'll get some data, but it's going to be old or not quite accurate. Or we may notice an anomaly in the data that wasn't caught because we were rushing to get the data, so it wasn't able to be cross-checked. It's really hard to get precise information. You don't want to come out to a media organization, let's say, if you have to, or to your employees or to your leadership, and say, well, we know that 62% of the time, et cetera, et cetera, and find out that actually the number was accidentally transposed, and it was only 26% of the time. So we need that ability to cross-check that data and information, because it's going to help us improve the time to make decisions. And what happens is, when we're in this sort of, we're not completely uh, disorganized and immature, but we, we are not as mature as certainly we want to be, it's a lot more expensive. We're spending double resources because one resource doesn't know what another one may be doing, or we may find that we are reaching into vendors twice, or others in our organization are tasked with double duties where they don't have to be. So it's re resource intensive. And then the messaging that we have ultimately based upon all of these blocks above us is that there's some messaging process going on. Most of the major channels we sort of address but the information is just sort of generic and reactive that we're putting out. We're not putting out information in the way that we really want it to be, which is to lead great act actions, to preserve the safety of people through leading them to right action, and to correct errors or miscommunication. We're not at that stage. Let's talk about what that stage looks like. And, and that's a more supportive stage we're in now. 
This is a pre-action stage where we've actually taken the time to think some things through. We have a defined process structure. We have defined decision rights, and there's little debate. That means all hands on deck, you get into the conference room, and everybody knows who's doing what, and there's little debate about cross-responsibility or lack of support. Roles are clearly defined. Responsibilities have been aligned and assigned to the right people with processes and event types and, again, the resources as needed. There's no confusion. There's clarity. I don't have to wait six hours to get approval for the purchase or uh, the alignment of new resources in order to create a response or reaction. I know that I have the funds set aside and the resources to do that. Gives me gives everybody responding to it a lot of faith in the organization as well. And that's why we say that uh, resiliency and preparedness are brand attributes. Because through all of this, whatever the crisis is, we have customers and we have vendors and we have the public watching to see how we perform. Are we going to lie and then spend the next 30 years in lawsuits? Are we going to try to recognize that there's a challenge and, and address it? I think if I say Takata airbags to anyone, we all shudder, don't we? Ooh, I don't want to be a part of that. That's what happens in an immature organization. It was a bad decision somewhere all the way up the chain. And in this preactive or supportive state, that is predefined. We have a data source that we've discussed how they're going to feed us information, what information they're going to feed us, where that information comes from, who is the central person who gets it, who, who controls versioning of it. We have a good central source so we can make good decisions because we have the data and input needed Maybe it's not complete, but it's a heck of a lot better than in that immature stage. So the time to decision making is a much more efficient process. In the immature stage, they're still sitting at the table and arguing about how this happened and how unprepared we are, while your team is out getting things taken care of, and communicating through a defined and refined messaging process through appropriate channels, effective, timely, accurate, and some of that messaging is standardized. You already had it prepared, and all you had to do was modify it somewhat so that you could make sure that's off the plate. And this is what we're all trying to get to. We're all trying to get to a culture where preparedness, resiliency, and strategic response is in the DNA of the organization. You want to be able to talk to anyone in your organization and have them know the playbook for major crises, the response, who makes decisions for what. Do we even need to come all of us to the table? Probably not, because we're such a good team. We work so well together. We just go right into our response mode. We have clearly defined and established roles and responsibilities. We are predefined by event type. Just because one person may be the lead in, uh, we're talking about communications today, but it could be in anything, 
in a circumstance, let's say for weather, it doesn't mean that's the right person in the circumstance for a product recall. We have different people whose expertise comes to the table dependent upon the type of crisis or event that is occurring. That just makes sense. And all of those people speak with the same language. We have support resources that are identified, our people are trained, and all areas are covered. When it comes to information, the basic and event type information is predefined. We have information processors, processes that are pre-established, and that way, we allow our people to respond quickly with data that's accurate and unique when we need it, and they're not pressured. You, you don't want your key people to be getting ulcers. You don't want to be so stressed out because you can't get that or you can't get information or you're being to deliver data and information, you do it if you're so do that to our. So we need to make sure we have plans and plays so that when a crisis happens, especially one that's a that's frightening, people are still able to function in a way that can improve the quality of the response overall. We want to be able to make highly efficient and timely decisions. We want to be able to anticipate what comes next and consume only the resources we need. And that's the key here, isn't it? In a really mature organization, you can't see the next two minutes because you're busy trying to figure out the, the past five. In a highly mature culture strategic approach, we are able to say, what's this going to do to us in six months? What's this going to do to us in a year? What, how do we need to prepare for the next few months? If you lose the facility, do you already have alternate resources set up? Well, if you're in a culture of strategic approach, you do. And you have a proven messaging process with predefined messages for major event types. Your message content is standardized, and then you can refine it as appropriate. And you just need three key messages. And we can share the three key messages that we've done and have used as a standard for many years. Again, you can download the infographic from the GoToWebinar toolbar, and that outlines those messages, approaches. And use that as your template to move forward. And now think about where you are. Do you want to be and what's your next Step. And maybe you can't go from stage one to stage four overnight. Take it one step at a time with simple goals. Whoops, I just went backward and I apologize. And move yourself forward to the best step you can that will benefit your organization. We want to be able to have controls that are aligned with value because preparedness and resiliency are brand attributes. And they save lives. So to start this out, we need to make sure that we understand how to work with the media, what our media choices are, we have to make sure that we're clear on our own brand. How do we control our message? What's the goal of our processes? And who determines the look and feel of our messaging? And then what are the building blocks 
of our organization, our mission, our philosophy, our policies, and the why we are communicating. When you think about the why, we're trying to build trust. We're trying to communicate the truth of an organization. We're trying to benefit decision making and encourage collaboration and cooperation. Last, we want to talk about is there a difference between transparency and complete disclosure. You have to sit down in your organization and decide what that answer is for you. Is transparency a core value or is it an unfortunate side effect? We need to define that for your organization. Do you understand your audience? And who are you committed to? I want you to think about what we did last uh, month. We said there was a, a situation where we had a, a Me Too issue. We had a mini exercise. And we were going to use data to understand that issue and then respond to the issue. So your exercise for this month is to download that infographic, and then I want you to create some message maps as if that situation happened. You had someone in your organization who was accused of some sort of sexual harassment or harassment of some type. I want you to just think about why you're going to communicate, identify who your target audiences are, identify what you need to do to correct any misperceptions, how, and prepare three key messages that communicate these talking points. Prepare very short messages for each key message, keeping them simple and short, and then document these messages and the delivery channels, and then practice delivery. This simple exercise will start moving your organization on the way to create a much more strategic culture of communications in a crisis. So download that uh, infographic from the toolbar. You can have us help you with self-guided assessments in our Crisis Stop program. You can talk to the beautiful and handsome Bill Baker at webinars at firestorm.com. And certainly, please register for the next webinar in this series, where we'll look at these uh, uh, steps that you've taken, we'll look at your homework, and we'll move you on to the next step. I went a couple minutes over. I do apologize. I do want to thank uh, Jay and the Association of Contingency Professionals and Bill Baker, our moderator. Joe, do you have any, uh, Jay, do you have any closing comments you'd like to make today? No, just a thank you. Well, thank you, and I hope everybody has a terrific day, and I look forward to speaking with you next month. Thanks so much, and this will end our session for today.